Hey, what's going on, guys? It is Brian and Jack with Simplemans Comics, and we have a great creator spotlight episode for you. We had them on the channel before, right before their book came out. Now we're having them back, and we're talking about Canto with those creators, the writer David Boer and the artist Drew Zucker. Welcome back to the channel, guys. Hey, great to see you. Yes. So, Canto's come out. We've had the first volume where we just had Final Order Cutoff for the trade paperback that David's holding up right now. We even talked about that on our last call show. So if you didn't get those orders in for FOC, you can still order it on Amazon for the time being. But highly recommend that if you haven't read Canto, stop, go back and read it, and then come back and watch this because you are missing out on a fantastic story. Isn't that right, Jack? Absolutely. Um, you know, this was one we championed from the get-go. Uh, just off the solicit, just off the preview that we were able to see, um, and getting able, being able to read it as the issues came out um, was what this was a book that Brian and I were excited to talk about on the various programs here on the Simplements Comics YouTube channel. And uh, now we're getting ready for the release of the collected trade um, coming out. What just in a couple weeks, right? Yeah, um, yeah. March March twenty fifth. Well, twenty fourth for the shops. Right, so getting that in March, and I want to just take a quick step back when we first had you on the channel, when we had that first interview with you guys, we didn't know what to expect, right? We, we read the first issue, Jack and I both loved it, we had Andy on here before from comicbookinvest.com, he was co-hosting with us, we all loved that first issue, we couldn't say enough high, good things about it, we, you were telling us what to expect in future issues, you were telling us some of the variant artists that were coming out for some of these, and we were all like had buzz about it, but until they released, until the story came out, until people got their hands on it, started hunting for it, no idea what to expect, right? None. Zero. And in, not, not, not at all. <laughs> Did it yeah, so or in fact, it's what was beyond anything that we ever anticipated. Look, we both love the story. We both love the art. We love this character. But the idea that it would come out and sort of take off the way it did it, it, it was crazy and it's funny that you, we, you talk about the first time we were on the show um i remember thinking we got on your podcast and didn't really know anything about you and um i had the thought i think it was a few days ahead of time we had the pdf preview of that first issue and i thought i better send this to these guys otherwise they don't want to know what to talk about right <laughs> So, right, you guys were just going... Seven seasons in a movie. Seven seasons in a movie. <laughs> Hashtag seven seasons in a movie. Um, yeah, so we talked to you guys, and it sort of, I think maybe part of it was being on your show, part of it was you guys talking about it, but it started ramping up um, right at FOC. I think before we hit the shelves, that first issue was in its third printing already. So it had already been sent to the printer, and they sent it back a couple times because... It was the pre-orders were um, getting more and more and more. But I'll tell the story about how um, I found out. I realized that it was something that was going to be kind of crazy and insane on release day. So the day before, so about a month before, um, our publicist had sent the cop, sent Canto to um, somebody over at the Nerdist. And it was a month and we hadn't heard anything, so we thought, okay. And then the day before release, Nerdist um, uh, posts this article that says, comics to pick up this week. And it was Marvel, Marvel, DC, and Canto. And a friend of mine sent me a text, and she's in, you know, geekdom. And this came across her feed, independent of anything I was doing. And she sent it to me. And um, I'll swear on the podcast, but basically her words were, holy shit. <laughs> and I said it to Drew, and I said the same thing. And, and so it was from there, I think, that then release day. It was just crazy. So, Drew, yep. how was your anticipation to the lead up and then the release? How did you feel? Say, let's just say issue one. Once issue one came out, were you, did you have a sense of relief or were you still like crossing your fingers or? So I, I did a signing the, on release day 
and the book sold out. They did 35 copies from my shop, which is a small shop. We went through everything. In between pull list and the signing, everything was gone. Um, and when the reviews started coming in, I was like, okay, thank God, I'm, I'm relieved. At least I know critically we're okay. And by all accounts, the numbers seem to be doing relatively well. But I, I've been around in the industry long enough to really kind of always be skeptical of any sort of success. I'm always waiting for the rug to get pulled out. So for me, we were also so deep into production, into other issues, that I just kind of put my head down and was like, all right, just keep promoting it and keep working. That's all you can do. Just, just keep it moving. When we went to San Diego, that's when it kind of hit me. Oh, wow. Okay. This is actually a thing that people have bought into and the book is successful to some measure. So that, that was really, San Diego was my big wake up call to how, how much people had, come to the project so trying to remember issue one came out in may yeah. right issue one came out june 26th okay. i believe because I was what i was getting at also is we asked about the first issue but i can also see jack and i talk about this on the show is how the first issue comes up it gets that buzz and then you get a drop off on the second issue yes we didn't see that through no, at least the three or four first three or four issues and that's what blew our minds i, I mean i had been mentally preparing myself that we would see a 50% drop off. I was just like, this is what happens with these books. And it makes perfect sense that all these people came to the book, they tried it and you're inevitably going to lose some people either through, you know, it not being for them or they just didn't like it or they just fall off of books. It happens. When the numbers came in on issue two, I was like, Oh, Okay. <laughs> Uh, I guess we're not seeing that yet. And then, yeah, until issue four, we issue four is when we began to see stabilization, and it was like, wow, okay, now, now the, we we may have we may have been onto something here. All right, real quick, so, David, you good? You, it was. Amber alert. Excuse my language. No, no, we're good. And, and it's cut out my audio and everything. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and it's no, we're going to make it work. How, however we have to, we'll make this work. The, the, it's, it's fine. I'm totally fine. Anyway, I don't know what you guys just talked about, but yes, to all of that stuff, yes. <laughs> so we were talking about um, how the success, like even after the first issue, we saw through like the first three issues there was a um hunt you know there was uh, people were hunting for that book like all the way you we we saw it um kind of drop a little bit in what issues f five yeah four five. Four, four five and six is where it started to stabilize out yeah but it was, that's when you get your true fans that's when you got yeah. rid of the i i would also say it, six had a weird scheduling thing with it and it did come out significantly later than we had had in the other with the other issues and that may have affected things it just kind of that's how it worked out scheduling wise so yeah and i think i oh i'm sorry jack no no go ahead i was gonna say and i think too that when you get to issue three um the printing's caught up yeah and, um uh you get a lot of people who just drop off and decide you know i'll finish it in the trade Yep. So I think four, five, and six were seeing people just waiting until the trade comes out. The the other thing we saw was that because of how staggered the printing runs ended up being, you had a for the first three issues, every time a print run was coming out with a new issue, issues one and two were coming back on the shelves in new printings. So it made it a really easy purchase for a shop to sell to people. Hey, this book is starting. They're up to issue three. You can get the second printings of issue one and two while, yeah. right, as you're getting issue three. Yeah. And it just kind of made it an easy sell for people. Jack, yeah, you actually, want to highlight how you've talked about that? On yeah, the we, yeah, we actually, we've talked about that. I think that was one of the smartest things um, that you guys did, IDW did, um, with the release of Canto. I've talked about other publishers who have kind of adopted that similar model. Um, I think it makes it, 
it really easy for a reader who has yep. maybe slept on a book for whatever reason. Um, you're walking into the shop, and I knew, always knew growing up it was always difficult. There were shops that you would go to, and it seemed like they didn't have issue one of anything. Right. Um, right. During the height of issue ones being uber popular and you would go into a shop and you'd see nothing but issues three, four, and five. And if you were trying to start reading something new, you were almost forced to read whatever <clears throat> came out in that given week. Yeah. Um, so the late printings releasing simultaneously with the upcoming issue, I think gave uh, the option for the new reader for, I mean, for $12 to be able to jump in and get say one, two, and three, uh, 16, be able to get the one, two, three, and four. And I think that that was, that was critical to continuing to grow the success throughout the issues because from our perspective, we saw it even going back further. This whole thing um, began for us. I messaged Brian when I saw uh, the previews and we're always, right, we speak to two communities. We speak to the, the, the readers and then of course that collector, investor, um, reseller community. And there was something about this book I've often talked about, uh, IDW books, and how they get sometimes overlooked in the market, but they're putting out quality work. And there was something about your book um, speaking to maybe an all-ages crowd um, that I thought had a lot of potential. So it started as a conversation with us, and then I think I saw, David, you on Twitter saying you, know, you were looking for podcasts, and it ended up working out. Um, and as we were kind of going through that process, it went from a book that we didn't, we didn't hear a ton of people talking about to then up to release date ended up being kind of the hot book of the week. Um, and that was such a big, a big sway from a couple months. And I think that it, your book is an example of what we've talked about on the channel before of the perfect storm where every community that is involved in comics was was chasing the book. You had collectors and resellers. Yeah. Um, you had readers, and then it wasn't just hype. You talked about Nerdist. Um, I, I think David, you and I have talked on on Instagram about the fact that there was a late spike after the book was out because consistently it was on year end top ten lists. Um, comics to read if you in twenty nineteen. Uh, so it is universally accepted. It was universally loved and that allowed it, no matter what anyone's preconceived notion was, say going into issue one, if somebody believed, well, you know, like Brian and Jack, people in our community, we're talking about it because we're trying to talk up a book or, um, you know, the retail community, what they're just trying to sell a book. It immediately became evident to people like, no. If you read it and you give it a chance, pe people from all it, communities were, were enjoying it. And I think that's kind of that, that sweet spot that you guys fell into. I think that's totally right. And I think it's, it's, um, it will never stop being amusing to me, that spike in December. Mm -hmm. Because I think 100% it's that people did not believe, they thought it was just hype. Yeah. And then when they saw it hitting these lists, they're like, oh, maybe it's not. Maybe it's actually something. And I, I, it just makes me laugh because this is something that we've all been talking about for six months before yeah. that. Right. It always then, it reminded me of like the old Hulk Hogan matches when they got Hulk Hogan in the sleeper hold and they do the arm drop once, the arm drop twice, and the third time and he gets comes up. back up and he's <laughs> shaking <laughs> his hand. <laughs> So full disclosure, like anytime Canto would slow down secondary market sales, Brian and I would get teased by people. They'd be like, oh, look at Canto. It's not selling as well as it was. Um, so like we even had to acknowledge it at one point um, on our, like the down portion of our show. But we were like, this is still, a, this is a good investment now because it's, it's, it's trading well below where it was. Um, and sure enough, in December, you know, th there was this, second rise and i th i think you're exactly right i think it solidified it as this is an important book for this year and has a chance to have staying power for a considerable amount of time and you have all the elements of staying power because we have another volume coming up um there's going to be there's going to be more canto and you mean canto and the clockwork fairy <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, the one shot as well. That's right. That's right. In previews now. So you, so um, you, have, you have so much. But what I would like to know, that coming back to that initial release, I don't know how much of this was on your radar, but I know in our community it was the absolute talk of the community. But the printing um, flaw that came with issue number one, uh, how much of that did, was something that affected you guys? Did it affect you guys? It, it drove us. Okay. What printing it, flaw? It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It, it um, drove us kind of crazy because it was like we we felt bad for people because we both understand that you know there are two markets that are being served here. There's the speculator market who are you know they're they're necessary to the market, and then there are the people that just want to read it. And it's unfortunate because it's something that was so completely out of our hands. And we did reach out to IDW about it. But it was one of those things that it went so far above even at their level. It was just one of those unfortunate things with a printer. And it's like, okay, you know, there's some of them out there. So if you guys want to hunt, I guess it's, it's one of those rare things for you to hunt. Go get it. I think it added an interesting element of intrigue. And I think as this book progresses, and you guys know how we've talked about it. A hundred percent. I think it's going to be a part of the story. Um, yeah. It, you know, no, that's for sure. There's, there's, there's copies that are mint. There's copies that aren't. People are still willing to pay good money for the copies that aren't. And you you showed a 9.8. There's, there's some talented pressers out there doing work to get books to 9.8. Who there have, are videos look, on YouTube look, of, yeah. of our book being pressed. I, it's like I, I have a hard time. I spend all my time by myself and talking to him all day. You know, I, it blows my mind that this thing that is really this accumulation of just me and David talking all day and doodling away on a computer that it, it's garnered that level of love and desire from people that they would pull the thing apart and figure out how to press the creases out. So here, here's, here's my theory about it. Um, you guys know all about comic collecting and you know about hot books and cold books and all that stuff. That Year of the Villain with Punchline that just came out, you know how many copies they printed of that? Like, a hundred thousand probably, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh yeah. We've got a print run of six thousand copies of that first printing. They came off the printer with a with a that spine crease. So it was a printing flaw. So some people are pressing it, you're getting nine eights out of it. Five years from now, when we look back at this and say, there's 30 copies that exist that are certified nine eight, something like that. That's gonna be what's gonna be valuable. It's not like you know, it's not hype about it because it's a new character, it's DC, it's Marvel, it's whatever. It's because there aren't that many copies out there. And I think that's what's going to be sort of the urban legend, the, the urban the story going forward is there aren't copies out there. And, you know, knock on wood, something really great happens in the TV and film world. And suddenly you have people looking for those nine eights. I, I, don't also, I also think it weirdly keeps people within that community talking about the book because if you were to say to somebody, um, printer defect, the most obvious modern example that comes to mind is, is Canto because it was a, such an in-demand book that was so widely um, affected by by the printer yeah. damage that it, it just... Um, it, that it just, I think right now it's kind of the prime example. So, you know, it's always kind of getting talked about and discussed and it's just, it's kind of, it, to me, it's, it's urban legend now. It's going to be cool, cool part of your mythos going forward. It, it's also that the, I'm convinced that this is a book that will truly find its life in trade, uh, at least in that first volume, because we kind of flew in so under the radar and you know, just kind of took everything by storm. Like David said, there are only so many copies from this first run of single issues. Ultimately, whatever life the book has going forward will 
you know, begin with that trade is my guess. So, yeah, I mean, I think all, all whatever issues popped up are just kind of feeding into that. So you, I, want, you I want to see that trade pop up in school libraries. Yeah. Yeah, us too. <laughs> well, check my – um, Elastic. I know, right? Check my, uh, my social media feed because I actually went – it's Read Across America. I saw, it, today. I saw it today. Like the book – what was the book that you got read to you that you were saying that you were going to read today? To oh, oh, yeah. So when I was eight years old, my dad came into our class and read Jumanji to That's us. Right. And he actually still, this is um, 30, over 30 years ago now. Um, he still has the thank you notes that the, um, the class sent to him for coming in to read. Um, so I thought, what a great way to, you know, that's how the universe works. So I went and um, read Jumanji to them. And I brought Canto and I talked about Canto. It's a little bit harder to read a graphic novel to a group of kids, but um, they were all over it. They were like, they were attacking me at the end. Is it going to be in the library? Can we buy it on Amazon? I was like, here, here's the website. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, that, that went better than, okay, boomer, get out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so when you guys were talking, too, about, like, you know, the almost the delayed reaction, and I, I totally agree with you about the longevity of Canto as a property and as an IP, as a brand, is going to be within that trade. I think that trade is going to have a lifelong, endless potential for you guys. But – one thing that I found interesting was come around the time when second and third prints for number one are being released, you started to see more and more conventions jumping on board and doing convention exclusives. You started to see some retailers jump on board. Um, that had to be a different feeling for you guys, almost a, a really like extra sugar on top sort of situation where not only are you getting to sell these chunks of books, but to do it in the later printings is very unconventional. It's not something we see in the market very often, but also that there wasn't any store exclusives for the first print. And then the, the stores came around and, yeah. and wanted to get involved with you guys. Um, that had to feel uh, extra sweet that, that uh, they came to that ended up coming to you guys to do that. I mean, it's bittersweet <laughs> yeah. only because only because it's like guys, We've been talking about this for months. Right. Suddenly, here, here you are asking about it. And some of them were, were bummed that they didn't get in the first printing. But to be honest, from a creator-owned perspective, to have convention covers and, yeah. I mean, to pull, to pull back the curtain a little bit, um, the cut that Diamond takes from books is for distri dis the distributor is so enormous. Yeah. And it's like, we get pennies. It's like, here's your pittance. And those other books are not, they don't go through diamonds. So it's amazing to, to see that. Yeah, when, when it's direct with the, the retailers or at a convention, it, it, the, the, piece of the pie you take is so significantly larger. So uh, that's why I want to say something right here to the audience. And Brian, I, I pray to God that you cut this later for us to use in micro content. I want everyone to understand when we talk about retailer exclusive variants and why Brian and I are not against retailer exclusive variants. I understand some of the negative practices that have gone on in that business. But when we talk about our support forum, what these guys are talking about right there is exactly why. Um, these are creators trying to make a living and the creation of this program and the ability for them to deal directly with the stores who are promoting their book to create these covers is a revenue stream for them that exceeds several others. So it, it is an absolute positive for this industry. I mean, I can tell you, I, I'll tell you, it's, we get um, for, for the goes through diamond, we get um, less than 10% of the cover price. And when it goes to the retail, you know, if there's a retailer exclusive out there, that's, it goes, it's, it's multiples of that. Yeah. So it's like 40% or something, somewhere in that, or maybe a little lower than that, but. It, and you're it, talking a few, this is not Batman selling a hundred thousand copies. Right. We're talking exactly. a, few, yeah. a thousand copies, a few thousand copies, and it just makes all the difference. And Jack, to your specific question, that's not something that Drew and I ever experienced, ever expected. Um, and when it happened and we started seeing it grow, it's just, 
it's it's mind boggling. Yeah. That first three nights when Canto Issue One came out, I I didn't sleep at all. It was terrible. And I was like, why do I feel so, why am I so nervous and stressed out about this book that's, that's successful? And it's just, it's, I don't know if I, did I say this earlier? Maybe I said it when we were recording. When I said, don't make any sudden moves, don't spook anybody. Just stay perfectly still and nothing, you know, everything will be just fine. So, David, did you have to use Drew defibrillator on him? Because was it? <laughs> we, we we got there a few times, uh, but no, I, I have yet to shock him. Although I I wouldn't mind it sometimes. It, it, for for me, San Diego was really like the big. It, like I said, it was a huge like holy shit. This is what this is what this is. Because I've been going to cons for years. Like I like everyone else in this industry. I play I can play Oliver Twist very well. Please, sir, may I have some more? <laughs> you know, I, I'm I'm used to going to shows and kind of peddling my wares and begging for work. Or you know, with with my last book, uh, The House, which I adore that book, and that book has done relatively well for a self-published through Kickstarter horror book. But it is exhausting because I am hand selling every single copy. When we went to San Diego, I landed and I got a text message from David saying, "We sold out of uh, San Diego." Oh yeah. And I was so, like, what, "What do you mean we sold out for the day?" And he was like, "No, we sold out of everything." Do you guys know the story of San Diego? Uh, no, I remember texting you saying, "Hey, um, I'm fully prepared to pay for it." Can I, how do I get a copy of the San Diego exclusive? And you're just like, my bad, bro. <laughs> I'm on the secondary market. So, so here's what happened, right? I think the print run was like 250 or something like that. Um, I went down to San Diego on Wednesday night uh, or Wednesday during the day. And I was out having dinner and I didn't actually get to the floor until a little after six o'clock. And the floor opens at six o'clock. And I got a... Um, message a text message from our editor at 6 19 on wednesday night and he said hey i'm pretty sure canto has sold out i'm like oh for the night great well i guess we'll just have to sign some copies tomorrow and he says no for the show <laughs> so 19 minutes after the floor opened this uh this book sold out that's awesome then, though I just, I mean, was it was incredible. I it was another you know, moment. It was almost another moment of controversy in the secondary market because there were, of course, those people who had hoped to get a copy. Um, there was the secondary market craziness that surrounded the book, um, and again, the first print popped again on the secondary market. And this is another thing that I think has given you guys this unique uh, situation since your book has come out. Is there's been these moments that have re-sparked, re-energized everything. So when the variants are exploding to, to just ridiculous prices on the secondary market, it's a, it makes people sit and go, wow, a lot of people are buying into this book. I need to pay attention to it. And then you start to see the other covers um, start to move. And kind of to Drew, to your point, one of the, the things, Brian and I do some con coverage. You guys are going to be able to check us out uh, this year at several conventions. Uh, we're coming to the West Coast very soon. But, you know, it's one of those things that's we, we do a lot of networking. We do a lot of interviews. We talk to a lot of creators and artists, Alley. And one of my favorite moments to watch in a comic creator's career, and I've seen it with Tom King, uh, where when he first started, he had a table and it was just his name written on a piece of paper and nobody was coming up to him. Mm -hmm. um, I saw it with Donnie Cates. Um, and then it's kind of that moment you're describing, Drew, in San Diego, where you go from really being at that convention pitching trying to get people to come to you pay attention to what i'm selling to the moment where they are coming no matter what you do and then it becomes managing handling yeah and uh um how much product can you possibly get out because they're willing to buy it all uh, it, and it happened to you guys just immediate i mean just overnight it, it, yeah it, it, it san diego so when we did the first signing, we kind of figured, oh, okay, well, you know, it'll go okay. But Joe Hill and Gabe Rodriguez were signing before us. 
So we were like, oh, we're probably going to get people in line who are like, are, are you guys Joe Hill and Gabe Rodriguez? Are you still signing? And Walt Simonson. Well, which one would you be? Uh, uh, no, I, I, just, just because Dave will be upset, I, I will be Gabe. Yes. <laughs> uh, Walt Simonson was signing at the table uh, next to us. And I was just like, okay, um, I assume the booth will wrap around about eight times for Walt, and I will probably have no one signing and just get in line to meet Walt. <laughs> uh, and then we sat down, and the, you would not have known that Joe and Gabe got up at any point. It, that first signing we did was utter madness, and it was just like, what, what is happening right now? And like, you're just, I mean, it helped. It definitely helped. They they put aside a stack of the convention exclusive yeah. cover, so the only way that you could get it at the show, what's that? It was gone in the first three seconds. Right, but the only way you could get a copy at that point on the Friday of the show was to be in line and and get it signed. Um, but yeah, what what Drew's describing, there it, we had a table and you turn. The, the line was around the corner, so you couldn't see it. And we poked our heads around, and it was all the way around the booth. Mm. And it's just, I mean, I don't, it's hard to describe because we're still, there's such a long way for us to go yet to really yes. build the audience and get a bigger audience and, you know, make ourselves more known. But that moment when we sat there for an hour and didn't get through the, got, you know, just barely got through that full line was just it's it's honestly it's what you dream about as a creator and you never think you're going to get there and even when you do get there you're just constantly pinching yourself i'm it's i'm just, super i'm super excited for you guys i love hearing how um this success the um emotion you know the excitement from the first time we talked and then just sitting back and watching you guys be so successful with this. We've talked about it before. This book hits on so many levels from um, the older to the young to this is the perfect book to sit there and read a kid to your kids with. Um, there's, you just, it's one of those feel good books. that's fun to read. Drew, your art in it's fantastic. And then you throw on those um, awesome variant covers that you guys have with those other great artists. It's just a well-rounded that anyone that sits there and argues with, oh, Canto this, Canto that, all you got to do is say, have you read it? And then most people, if they, if they say no, and then say, read it and come back to me, no one really has that argument anymore once they've read it. They usually come back. I haven't heard someone read it and say, you know what? I didn't really like it. I mean, what amazes that. me is the people who like it and you wouldn't think that it wouldn't be their type of book. Um, you know, uh, that, that to me is the testament uh, of that cross, what you talk about, Brian, that cross-sectional where it's... When we did the signing, the cross-section of people that you saw come to it was really kind of the proof for us that, oh, okay, what we set out to do actually worked yeah. because it... it Multiple would, demographics, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. across, across the board from, I, I don't know, I think the youngest kid we saw was like 10 or 11 years old to the, you know, 60-year-old retailers to the speculators to the basic readers, you know. It, it was, so two, it so was two CGC people. What? Two people who were for CGC. They waited in line. It was awesome. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> so we've talked about when you were on the show before and it was coming out, we've talked about that, that journey you guys had since let's kind of shift those gears now. And let's talk about where you guys are going. We got the, the one shot coming, but we got plenty of some more cancer. This is the good thing is cause I remember when we t had you on the show before we were like, Hey, would you, where do you like to see this go? Seven seasons in a movie, of course, but looks like we're kind of rounding that corner hitting second season on that. Right. Yeah, so, um, yeah, like you said, we're, we're, the one shot comes out in May, Canto and the Clockwork Fairies, <clears throat> and then we've got a five-issue, um, Canto 2, which we're calling it a true sequel. Um, it's uh, going to come out in July, it starts, for five issues. 
Um, the exciting, couple exciting things for your specific um, audience is we've got two retailer incentive covers for issues, uh, the one shot and issue one, um, a one in 10 and a one in 25. So thank it. you. For Thank you to every single person who read this book, because if it wasn't successful the way it was, there's no way we would have been able to justify a one in 25. Now also go buy the book so that we can justify these things. The one in 25, but um, Nick Robles is doing the one in 10, and Mateus Santaluoco is doing the one in 25. Um, now he did the one in 10, Nick Robles did the one in 10 for issue one. Yes. Did, Correct. Yeah. And then he was oh. also not to take away from, but David Brewer, you've worked with him before and was an alien bounty hunter, right? Alien bounty hunter. Yeah. Um, and he's just fantastic. And he's, his art yeah. is unbelievable. He's now, what's that? He's having his own blow up. He, he's, he's doing great. He's a huge fan his, of alien bounty hunter here still, by the way. Oh, awesome. Awesome. I have a copy of that right over here. Um, uh, yeah, so he's actually drawing the dreaming in the Sandman universe uh, for DC right now. So that's that's pretty great. Um, plus, he's a close personal friend. And um, uh, we wanted to give him that opportunity on the uh, one shot. Um, and then issue one is coming and it's kind of a sequel to the original story. Um, I. I think the solicit comes out in, if it's July, it would be the um, May, no, April. Yeah. So the end of this month, it'll be posted on, on online. So I, I, I don't know how much I can share with you guys at this point. Um, yeah, don't, don't get in trouble. I mean, we're always happy for like exclusive information, but we never want to get anyone to get in trouble or betray anyone's right. trust. All right, so I, I, I will say this much about it. It is, if volume one is a very set on its very singular path kind of story, this is taking that idea of, you know, of having the classic kind of hero's journey, but expanding it on a much grander scale. Like, the, Canto, look at it this way. It, volume one is very much about Canto and the reader learning about Canto's world and Canto realizing just how, you know, that, oh man, I, my world is much bigger than just what I have known. Volume two explores that, yeah, your world is much bigger than what you've known. And, guess what? Now you're out in it. And that world is maybe not as kind and wondrous as you thought when you first got into it. Right. So one of the things we really wanted to do was to expand the storytelling opportunities. So that's why we did a one shot. It really is, um, I like to call it a side quest <laughs> for Kanto. And it's a single issue, single story. We meet some new characters and it expands his world. And then Canto 2 is a true, um, the, the end of, the end of uh, issue six, it's um, Canto 2 sort of jumps off at that point. There's another um, situation that Canto discovers his people in, um, and he has to go on another adventure. And this time, instead of just saving the one he loves, he's going to actually have to save all of his people um, before their time runs out. We'll put it that way. So I got to jump in on this uh, 1 in 25 incentive that you talked about. That that excites me because we've talked about those on the channel a lot. Kind of the key we've talked about to those in the speculation and investing community that I, everybody knows that watches the channel that Investing in IDW books, something I've done for years, and I've said that one of the kind of secret sauces is when you see that one in 25 variant. That yeah, that's when those ears pop. Whoop. Yeah, when I see that one in 25. Really? Variant, yes, that is the. What is it about that? What is this one 25? Well, because first off, one of the negatives that an investor they're they're so conditioned by the big two, Marvel and DC. And Marvel and DC operate on that one in 25 incentive, usually being the lowest ratio incentive. They'll sometimes do one in tens, but IDW basing on one in tens, which I get it. You, you're dealing with a smaller print run. So you want to incentivize the re reader more. Um, 
But when you go to that one in 25, it tends to attract an audience that wouldn't normally pay attention to a one in 10 incentive or even an IDW book. Yeah, because they're always like, wait a minute, IDW doesn't do many one in 25s. There's a one in 25 here. What's going on? And even though you'll hear the negatives, because I already know what you guys are going to say out there. You're going to say, oh, you know, well, retailers will be on top of it. They better be on top of it this time. Now, no doubt retailers need to get, get in touch Get in touch with whoever you need to get in touch with, with IDW, with these guys to get those exclusives created. But um, I want to see some, you know, unique art all over the place for, for these, you know, the one shot and that, that uh, second volume. But, you know, at the same point, those 125s still won't be on the market like a Marvel 125, like an amazing Spider-Man 125. Oh, right. Yeah, it'll, yeah. it'll be worlds more scarce. And what yeah. we see is there's so many fans of properties uh, that like IDW or Boom or, or you know, um, people like that produce where um, there's going to be a lot of people who are buying Canto and keeping Canto. They're buying it for themselves because they love it. And that ends up taking those copies off the market. So the amount of available copies tends to dwindle in an IDW 125. So it's one of my favorites. So the moment you said 125s, it's so funny to me that going into the first volume, I love the all ages aspect of it and that it still seemed cool to me. And then going into this one, now uh, this is already a story I love. You're telling me you're at the 110, 125, which tells me what IDW believes in. It tells me, uh, that they've got the faith in you guys and you know, we've got the faith in you. So I, I think that, that this is going to continue to be a ball that keeps rolling. I just and, and it says that David and Drew and IDW put the comic community on notice with this title. People are having that want for it. And yeah, I don't think this number one, one in 25 uh, is going to be overlooked. I think people are going to be, you know, once it comes out and the news spreads, people heavily are going to be wanting heavily, that for sure. Yeah, heavily. I, I cannot wait for you guys to see the art for it. And I'm going to, I don't think we've announced yet who the cover artists are for the, um, the, the two for um, issue one of volume of the Canto 2. But I think they're artists that you love. And in particular, both of them are going to just blow the market away i think and in particular that one in 25 it's a such a different style than anything that we've done up till this point and jack like you said it really plays into that all that all ages aspect to it and it's just it's one of my favorite covers that we've done and we've done so many covers for this it's really one of my favorites and i i really can't wait for you guys to see it only my favorite covers are the only ones that Drew does. Uh, agreed. <laughs> agreed. Well, see, that's for me, like when I think Canto, that's what I think of. Like, I think Canto, my favorite is like the simple Canto number two. Uh, that's right, my favorite right. cover. It, it's just, it just, to me, that, that screams who the character is. But so one of the things that to me is fun is as this property that, that like, we all feel so invested in and obviously you guys as creators feel beyond and it's your baby um it's fun to watch these other artists and these other artists we're fans of do like i'm a big ben bishop fan so it was cool when ben bishop did a variant cover um it, so now i want to see as the character grows in popularity i i can't wait to see what other artists give their take uh on on canto that's 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 always that's been fun um and, and I think it's only going to get bigger and, and wilder. And real quick, just like Ben Bishop, you guys need Canto skateboard decks. Listen, Ben is, if, if you ever have the chance to talk to Ben, he is an absolute genius who just never stops figuring out how to produce all this weird stuff. And like he, he is the shining example of how to build your brand. Like the skateboard decks were one of the coolest things I've ever seen, and the uh, the eleven by seventeen artist print that he did for uh, I think it was Target Target R, uh, the Ninja Turtles book he did. I was texting him like, "So how many did you make, and how much did it cost you?" Because I'm tempted to do it. Yeah, I think yeah, 
having some Canto prints would be a good thing, especially if you do do any booths or signings. And yeah, it's definitely. I, I've looked into doing artist prints and just to see what it would cost. And it's definitely, it's stuff that when I finally get back around to doing like the real con scene again, I, I will definitely look into stuff like that. That's one of the things too that I love about um, all the different artists we've gotten is like you said, seeing these different takes on it, on Kanto, the character. It's just, it, it's, it's amazing. That's why another thing that was fun too, Drew, talking about you from an artist perspective. Um, another book that Brian and I talked about on the channel was Folklords with Boom Studios. And you did a Folklords variant that both Brian and I um, added to our personal collections. That was pretty cool. Um, you know, do, I, do you think that Canto is going to provide you with some opportunities to do more things like that? I, I hope it does. Um... Right now, I, I've had no real offers to go and, like, do other stuff. There's been, you know, the occasional pop-up thing, like Folklords. But in all honesty, right now, I'm so swamped into Kanto that it's like, okay, I, I'm, I'm good with little stuff popping up here and there. But Kanto's kind of my main focus right now is to just make that as good as I possibly can. Because I, I set so many goals for myself with Volume 2. And quite frankly, David has insisted on writing things that are making me slam my head. In <laughs> just because Kanto has 100 best friends doesn't mean... <laughs> I want to stop working. They're and all, all look unique. Yeah, yes, that's what's in the script. <laughs> <laughs> they all look different. <laughs> Even though it's a book about a group of 10 people that are basically designed to, be, to live in conformity. <laughs> right, exactly. Perfect. Should I tell them about one of the covers? Yeah, sure, go for, for it. For Canto 2? Go for it. Okay, yes. So, yes. Jack, you, you said one of your favorite artists was Ben Bishop? Yes, yes, absolutely. So... Um, I'm just going to go ahead and reveal it. Uh, Kanto, when he goes out on his new journey, he has three best friends. He has three, three friends that are going to go out on this journey with him. And Ben's doing the one in 10 for us. And it's going to be a um, tribute to the first, the number one uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cover. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's doing the one in 10. And then um, we've got the one in 25. So, yeah, so he did it based uh, as a tribute to TMNT number one back so in then, 84. So then to look at it, what happens a lot of times when IDW does these 125s is that the one in 10 then gets almost immediately overlooked because the one in 25 gets um, the market attention. I don't know if this was done consciously or not, but the, the fact that there's that TMNT homage tie-in to the one in 10 is is genius because you are not going to be able to ignore that that's not no matter what attention gets placed on the 125 due to scarcity um that's gonna get a whole a whole different fan base um paying attention to it because we've seen that with other independent titles like i remember that that book was it square ears that came out years ago with squirrels um they did homages and the left david it's good um shelf though it's so it's funny you say that, Jack, because we did go back and forth on who should do the one in ten, who should do the one in twenty five, and my philosophy on it is, um, you know, do two different covers that we're gonna move. You know, it doesn't matter really where you put them, but also, if Ben's is gonna be the one that gets all the traction, I'd honestly rather have a lot of shops jumping on the one in ten. Um, rather than shops, the smaller shops being um, not not being able to go to the tw one in twenty five, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I. But think then it'll also help because now you'll have shops ordering even more to not only get the one in twenty five, but oh, now I get more of these one in tens. That yeah. see, so here's the here's the real genius of it all: one in ten, one in twenty five. You should just order fifty copies. You get two twenty fives. You get yep. five tens. So there's 20, there's 20 covers for the first run total. And I'm going to get a, I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to get a spinner rack or, you know, the tall spinner racks. And there's one of mine that has 10 slots on each side. 
And so I'm going to have 10 covers on one side and 10 covers on the other side and just keep adding to it. Yeah. So we talked about the beginning or the genesis of Canto. We talked about that journey through. We talked about what's to come from Canto with some great freaking issues, great variant covers. Want to appreciate you guys for coming on the show real quick before we let you guys go. Both of you guys, tell us, what do you guys have coming up? What are you guys working on? What, you know, what do you want our viewers to know about you two? Um, well, I guess I'll say uh, working on a bunch of Canto. I've got a couple of things in the pipeline that uh, haven't been announced yet, so keep your eyes out for that. And I want to thank everybody for taking a chance on our little clockwork hero. Um, it's been an incredible journey, and especially you, Brian, and you, Jack, just for believing in us way at the beginning when you saw that glimmer of hope in our eyes, that, <laughs> that, that fear and, and you know, hope that we would have something. And now here we are. Also, order the trade. It's coming out in two weeks. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to say, you know, thank you to you guys because you, you along with everyone else really made the difference here, but you guys – believed in this big time early on and it seriously to everybody that picked this book up uh, either as a speculator a reader or you know if you started off speculating and became a fan down the road i mean it, do not think that that is taken for granted by either me or david we it is something we take very seriously and it's something we are enormously grateful for and you know we're, we're just working our butts off to try and make sure that Volume 2 and Clockwork Fairies is as good, if not better, than what came before it. And, you know, like David said, March 24th, the trade will be out. Uh, you can pre-order Clockwork Fairies now. And in, at the beginning of April, uh, pre-orders will open up for Volume 2. And we can start getting, you know, back on the Canto Road. And that's about it. We're excited to get it in everyone's hands. I want to thank you guys for joining us again for your second interview here on the Simple Moons Comics uh, YouTube channel. And, you know, the gratitude you guys showed us blows me away because, you know, we were just, we're just fans. We're just two guys who were able to see something and believe in it. And it's been really fun as fans of the property to watch the success and that everybody loved it. And again, to, to our community, um, I know a lot of you guys out there are collectors and investors, your resellers, your retailers. Um, you will not see two creators so kind to that community, a community that sometimes um, has trouble with the relationship with the industry. Um, these are two guys who try to do something for every community. So make sure you guys go out there, talk to your LCS, it's in previews now. Make sure you're pre-ordering Clockwork Fairies. We're talking about a, a one in 25 incentive on a one shot, which is absolutely uh, a rarity in the industry. Um, so be on the lookout for that. But right now, the most pressing thing is talk to your LCS because in just a couple of weeks, that volume one trade is, is hitting stores. So if you slept on it, don't be embarrassed. Don't be shy. Talk to your LCS. Let them know. Let them know because they need to know to order that for the shelf. You know how LCSs are to order one or two for the shelf. Make sure you are pre-ordering this trade. Um, also, check Amazon everywhere else. But talk to your local comic shop first. We always want to say that. Make sure you guys are liked and subscribed. We're going to let you know. All this new Canto stuff coming out, we will have more coverage. And uh, we'll check you guys out in the next video.